When one thinks of France, famous icons such as the Eiffel Tower, the Louvre Museum, and the charming streets of Paris spring to mind. Under its appealing nature, the country is known for its cultural opulence, educational system, and creative prowess, but it conceals a buried narrative of colonial exploitation and the persistent scars of French imperialism. France was a major contributor to the economic destruction endured by many African countries, including Haiti. The country's engagement resulted in long-term dependency by implementing policies that maintained its need on France while extracting their resources. Despite its architectural marvels, educational system, and creative achievements, the terrible destruction it wreaked on its colonial areas is rarely acknowledged. In this video, we will expose a hidden and forgotten truth that differs from conventional media. We shall investigate France's negative impact on countries such as Haiti, Guinea, and other African countries. This project is not a history lesson, but rather an investigation of how France's dominance over several African countries continues, resulting in resource exploitation. Our goal is to expose the truth, with the hope that France and other former colonial powers will confront their historical crimes and actively work to address the imbalances that have come from centuries of exploitation. Before you watch the video, please show your support by clicking the like button and subscribing to the channel. By doing so, you will be kept up to date on our fascinating investigation of the untold black narrative. The exploitation of Haiti, as typified by the tale of Saint Domingue, a former French colony, will be revealed. This instance exemplifies the harshness of French actions. The colony thrived by enslaving Africans on plantations, a harsh strategy that produced significant wealth for France at the terrible expense of countless lives. The Haitian people rose up against their oppressors in 1791, eventually triumphing in their war for independence in 1804. However, the cost of attaining freedom would eventually prove prohibitive, as France was steadfast in maintaining its precious acquisition. By October 1806, Haiti had been divided, with Alexander Patient ruling in the south and Henry Christophe ruling in the north. Both rulers had served in the Haitian Revolution. Despite this, the French had not totally abandoned their desire to regain their former colony. In 1814, King Louis X. Villani, who had helped to depose Napoleon, sent three commissioners to Haiti. Their purpose was to assess the country's leader's willingness to yield. Despite France's open determination to re-establish slavery, King Christophe remained steadfast and obstinate. In response to this disclosed strategy, Hitler issued war threats. Baron de Vaste, a key participant in Christophe's inner circle, underscored that our independence will be protected by the points of our bayonets, demonstrating unyielding determination. Patient, who administered the southern region, on the other hand, demonstrated a desire to participate in negotiations hoping that the nation could potentially give compensation to France in exchange for acknowledgement of its autonomy. Following Christophe's death in October 1820, Boyer took on the mission of unifying the nation's previously divided factions. Despite the lack of Christophe's impediment, Boyer faced repeated failures in his efforts to successfully secure France's recognition of Haiti's sovereignty. However, on April 17, 1825, the French king's posture abruptly changed. He issued a decree declaring France's willingness to accept Haitian independence in exchange for hefty payment. The stated price was 150 million francs, which was nearly 10 times the amount paid by the United States for the acquisition of the Louisiana Territory. This substantial sum was meant to compensate the French colonists for financial losses caused by the abolition of the slave-based revenue system. Baron de Macau, sent to deliver the proclamation by Charles X, the successor to Louis XVII, landed in Haiti in July, escorted by a fleet of 14 warships holding almost 500 cannons. Refusing to accept the decree would almost definitely result in a declaration of war, effectively launching the exploitation of Haiti at that very time, accompanied by the threat of violence. Recognizing the terrible repercussions, Boyer signed the tragic contract on July 11, 1825. This contract stated that the current residents of the French part of Saint-Domingue were expected to make five equal payments, totaling 150 million francs, in order to compensate the former colonists. According to recent press reports, 
the French king was fully aware of the Haitian government's restricted capacity to make these payments, given that the total surpassed Haiti's yearly budget by more than tenfold. Haiti, unable to meet its obligations, was forced to borrow 30 million francs from French banks only to make the first two payments. As a result, it came as little surprise when Haiti defaulted on its obligations shortly after. Despite this failure, the newly minted French king sent out another expedition in 1838, this time with 12 vessels to put pressure on Haiti's government. The outstanding debt was reduced to 60 million francs as a result of this 1838 amendment, known as the Traité d'Amitié or Treaty of Friendship. The Haitian government, on the other hand, was once again forced to acquire costly loans to settle the remaining sum. Even though the colonists claimed that the indemnity was only a fraction, a mere one-twelfth of the value of their lost properties, which included the people they considered to be their enslaved labor force, the total sum of 90 million francs was actually equivalent to five times France's annual budget. According to current estimates, Haitians finally paid more than twice the amount requested by the colonists due to compounded interest on the loans, which remained unpaid until 1947. The impact of France's interventions on the stability and prosperity of Haiti cannot be emphasized. This demand for restitution not only extended the cycle of poverty, but also symbolized the capture of Haiti's resources. In sharp contrast to mainland France's poverty rates, where 14.1% of the population falls below the poverty line, Haiti is in a dire situation with a 59% poverty rate. This high economic inequality reflects the long-term consequences of a history defined by exploitation and economic unfairness. To make matters worse, the median annual income of a French household exceeds $30,000, in striking contrast to the meager sum of $450 for a Haitian family. These enormous disparities in wealth and incomes highlight the long-term consequences of labor extracted from generations of Africans and their descendants. The French indemnity, which was imposed on Haiti by force, exacerbates the country's economic difficulties. This indemnity required recompense from a people who had previously been slaves to those who had previously held them in bondage, an unprecedented occurrence in history. The weight of this indemnity exacerbated Haiti's economic woes, exacerbating the country's struggle to break out from the cycle of poverty and weakening Guinea's progress. When Sikou Touré of Guinea decided to break away from the French colonial empire and pursue independence for his country in 1958, the French colonial elite in Paris reacted angrily. This rage culminated in a historic act of aggression, when the French administration in Guinea went on a frenzy of destruction, targeting anything within the country that they saw as benefits of French colonization. Approximately 3,000 French people left Guinea, taking all of their goods with them and inflicting damage to anything that could not be relocated. This included the demolition of schools, nurseries, and government buildings. Automobiles, books, medical instruments, research institution equipment, and tractors were all damaged on purpose. Farm animals such as horses and cows were slaughtered, while food supplies and warehouses were set ablaze or polluted. The goal of this horrifying conduct was to send a strong message to all other colonies that resisting France's rule would result in serious consequences. This brazen display of aggressiveness instilled dread in the African elite, and no other colony found the bravery to follow Sikou Tour's example after the events in Guinea. His ringing motto, we prefer freedom in poverty to opulence in slavery, became well known but did not encourage other colonies to follow suit. Following Guinea's desire to establish its own national currency in 1960, France launched a clandestine campaign known as Operation Purcell with the goal of weakening the young nation's stability. This operation was designed with two main goals in mind, causing economic collapse and encouraging armed uprisings against the Guinean government. External documentation services inside the Contra Espionage Unit stationed in Senegal were used to carry out this scheme. Their mission was to manufacture large quantities of counterfeit Guinean francs in order to flood the country's economy. The ultimate purpose was to cause hyperinflation and economic collapse, similar to how the Nazis used Operation Bernhard. When destabilization operations in former colonies failed to have the desired results, 
French authorities resorted to new measures to maintain control over these regions and continue reaping profits from their resources. France would exert its authority over the national reserves of 14 African nations, all of which were former colonies beginning in 1961. Benin, Burkina Faso, Guinea-Bissau, Ivory Coast, Mali, Niger, Senegal, Togo, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, Congo Brazzaville, Equatorial Guinea, and Gabon were among the countries represented in this group. Following the French government's acceptance of the Bretton Woods Agreement in December 1945, the CFA franc was founded. It was afterwards used as the currency of the French colonies in Africa, formerly known as La Colonies Françaises d'Afrique, or CFA. The French treasury provided currency stability with a fixed exchange rate, but as a condition, the African nation was required to deposit 50% of its CFA franc reserves with the French Central Bank, essentially ceding France control over the country's resources. Following that, the CFA franc was divided into two distinct entities, the Communauté Financière de Frique de l'Ouest, or the Financial Community of West Africa, which included nations such as Benin, Burkina Faso, Côte d'Ivoire, Guinea-Bissau, Mali, Niger, Senegal, and Togo, and the Communauté Financière de l'Afrique Centrale, or the Financial Community of Central Africa. African states have repeatedly attempted to break free from French rule, but African revolutionaries and former French colonies are frequently met with violent opposition from the French government. The demise of Bartholomew Boganda is a glaring example of this tendency. Boganda, who presided over the Central African Republic from December 1958 to March 1959, attempted to dissolve many of the links that bound his country to France during his presidency. Notably, he founded the Movement for the Social Evolution of Black Africa, a political group dedicated to the liberation of French colonies in Africa, including the Central African Republic and the French Congo. Boganda was instrumental in obtaining the country's independence and hoped to use his clout to free other African areas from French domination. France seized Boganda during his 1951 campaign, accusing him of disrupting the peace in an attempt to repress the Central African Republic's rising independence movement. Despite being released soon after, he died tragically in a plane crash in March 1959. The French General Secretariat of Civil Aviation led the inquiry into the jet crash, but its results were never made public. The French journal Lex Press obtained portions of the report confirming the presence of explosives in the wreckage of Boganda's plane. As a result, the French High Commissioner took steps to censor all copies of the Express daily disseminated in the Central African Republic. Another case in point is Cameroonian Marxist politician Félix Roland Mummy, who died in 1960 after a French Secret Service agent put thallium in his drink while in Geneva. Yumiobi, another Cameroonian leader, was assassinated by the French soldiers in 1958. Sylvanus Olympio, the initial president of the Republic of Togo, was yet another notable African man who met a tragic end as a result of his efforts to progress his country's well-being and put a stop to the French oppressive tactics. During the 1960s, he launched a struggle to free his country from French authority by opposing the maintenance of the colonial contract. He eventually agreed to make annual payments to France as a type of debt repayment for the alleged benefits Togo received from its colonial past. This restriction was the only way to keep the French from wreaking havoc on the country before leaving. Nonetheless, France decided an extravagant price, with so-called colonial debt payments amounting to roughly 40% of the country's budget by 1963. As a result, the newly independent Togo's financial stability was severely harmed. To remedy the situation, Olympio decided to abandon the monetary system created by colonial France. Instead, he launched the national currency as a means of navigating out of this precarious financial scenario. Three days after the production of the newly introduced money began on January 13, 1963, a gang of troops, assisted by French forces, captured and killed Olympia, the first democratically elected leader of an independent African country. Sergeant Edienne Nasing Bay, a former member of the French Foreign Legion, carried out his execution. 
In addition, the French embassy in the area awarded him a payment of $612 for a job well done. Olympia's goals were different from those of the French in that they focused on creating a self-sufficient and independent country. Mason Bay would eventually become president and put the French-mandated monetary system in place, including the CFA franc. This strategy allowed France to exercise economic influence that hinders the growth and independence of many African countries by controlling a sizable amount of their reserves. Concerns about neocolonial power relations are also exacerbated by the presence of French military installations throughout Africa, which adds to worries about political instability. The importance of bringing these issues to light and spreading awareness of the negative effects of France's actions cannot be overstated. Consider the CFA franc, which drastically limits the economic options open to African countries and keeps them dependent on France. Their inability to address important social and developmental concerns is significantly hampered by this reliance, which exacerbates the cycle of poverty. These nations are prevented from independently determining their own futures by this supremacy, which strengthens their economic dependence. The chances for Africa's growth are limited as long as France continues to see Africa only as a way to increase its own wealth and political influence on the world stage. It becomes necessary to address these issues and engage in conversations that address both the historical and current effects of France's actions in order to pave the path for an equitable and just future for African nations, similar to our efforts in Haiti. African nations must wrest control of their political affairs and economic resources back from neocolonial forces. Remember to always help us by giving the video a thumbs up, joining our channel, and sharing our material to raise awareness of the actual stories of Black experiences and strengthen their voices. Catch you guys in the next one.